Hi, and welcome back to another week of Universal Algebra and Lattice Theory. For those of you uh, generous souls who are actually following along with me in real time, you will notice that it is not actually the date uh, when I had intended to record this lecture initially. Um, so I thank you for bearing with me and I will try to get back onto the schedule that I had initially set for myself. Uh, not that it's an excuse, but I did actually have some sort of mild illness, which turned out not to be the uh, very popular as of right now in 2020 uh, coronavirus, but just some other sort of cold, which I am now over. So let's get back to it. Today I'm going to be talking about complete lattices. And so First of all, I'm going to motivate what the definition of these is, then I will actually give the definition and give some examples and non-examples of complete lattices. I'll discuss subuniverse and congruence lattices, and we'll see that having the language of complete lattices is helpful there. And then we'll talk about complete sublattices, and we'll finish off with a discussion of congruence lattices of groups and of lattices and we'll have some nice characterizations of those. So let's get right to it. Consider the lattice L whose elements are subsets of the natural numbers and whose meet and join operations are intersection and union. This is an example that we have seen before. And so if we take any subset of the collection of subsets of the natural numbers, so for example, this fancy X set, which I am atrocious at actually writing, so I don't know why I, I, I chose it as my notation. Uh, so for example, we could take this set to be the set consisting of all, uh, let's say, sets containing 1, 3, 5. So all of the singletons, which are odd, contain a single odd number, and say, let's also have it contain uh, two, four, 17, that set, and maybe uh, three and eight as well as another set. So X can be some perhaps infinite collection of subsets of the natural numbers, like this example where this ellipsis indicates all the other singleton sets where that single element is some odd number. So we can take the union of all of those guys and get another subset of the natural numbers. Explicitly in this example, we actually have that the union of this script X that I'm absolutely horrible at writing uh, would just be the collection of all odd numbers, one, three, five, and so on forever, um, along with all of the even numbers that we happen to add in from these other couple sets, which would have two, four, and eight, and that's it. And so this is still a subset of the natural numbers. And so it turns out that that union is actually the least upper bound for all of the, that collection of subsets uh, in this lattice L. And so uh, we can think of that union like an infinite join of the members of our perhaps infinite collection of, of uh, sets X. Okay, so we had an only really defined operations of finite arity so far uh, in this series of talks. We never really discussed an operation that combined infinitely many things together at once, but we can think of this infinite union as being an infinite join of the members of this collection X. So actually being able to uh, discuss such a thing and think of it like an infinite join uh, isn't something that we can do in any possible lattice. So now if we instead consider only the finite subsets of the natural numbers, so uh, then I'll actually draw a bit of the Hasse diagram here for the lattice of all subsets of the natural numbers. So up here at the very top, we have the naturals, the very bottom, we have the empty set, 
pretty low down. We have a singleton like one, other singletons like two. And above these two guys, we have the set containing one and two. And of course, many other things. And below this demarcation here, we have all finite sets. And then up above that, we can think of this being the world of infinite subsets, which would contain things like the set consisting of all of the powers of two, as well as many other things. Okay. So if we restrict ourselves only to this world of the finite subsets of the natural numbers, we still have a lattice under the same ordering or with the same meet and join operations, intersection and union. But now if we consider this collection X, where I, for no apparent reason, have changed my notation to something I can write more easily. Uh, if we consider this collection, which has all of these initial sections of the natural numbers, we'd like to think of it that way, one, one, two, one, two, three, and so on forever, then this collection X has no upper bound in L if L is only the lattice whose elements are the finite subsets of the natural numbers. And so if X has no upper bound, it certainly doesn't have a least upper bound because it has no upper bound at all. <laughs> and so uh, the supremum of X does not exist in L, even though the supremum of this collection would exist in the lattice of all subsets of the natural numbers. Uh, this collection has no upper bound in this new lattice L that we're considering. So these suprema of infinite collections or these infinite joins, if we'd like to think of them that way, don't exist in all possible lattices. All right. So this is kind of a special situation and we would like special language for it. So we say that a lattice L is complete when given any collection of elements of that lattice, we have that both the supremum of that collection and the infimum of that collection exist. And so remember that this is much stronger than our initial condition that we had for a pose set to be a lattice, where we just said that the inf and sup of any pair of elements had to exist. And so uh, we have some new notation to go along with this new situation, which occurs for some lattices, but not for all of them, where we're going to write big V of X to denote the supremum of a collection of elements X and big wedge of X to denote the infimum of a collection of elements X. And so this goes along with our usual notation because if big X is a set, say little y, Z, then, uh, say this uh, join of X is going to just be uh, Y join Z. But if X is an infinite collection, then we don't really have notation for that already. And so that's, uh, that's where this is helpful. Okay, and so uh, if we have a set X that's actually given to us in sequence notation, then we're going to write this index join of the little xi to denote the supremum of x as well. And so if I had been a little less lazy, I could have uh, written this infinite join as being indexed over a set i. And then this is actually uh, very similar to the notation that we have for infinite unions indexed over some index set because Well, we chose it this way because, because uh, actually in our initial example, this infinite join in the lattice of subsets of the natural numbers was the union of uh, all of those, all of those uh, individual subsets xi, if we had chosen to index our entries in our sequence of subsets. So it's not a coincidence that these notations are very similar to each other. I mean, I can't say historically that that's exactly the reason why the notation was chosen, but it, it is entirely logical that these two things would look similar to each other. And we have similar notation for uh, infinite meets or infima as well. So now let's look at a bunch of examples. 
And so I'm going to uh, draw my picture of the Hasse diagram for the natural numbers as much as I can stand to draw and as much as you can bear to see since my artistic skills are somewhat wanting. We have the empty set down here, the set containing one, set containing two, the set containing one and two. And we have all of our finite stuff down here. And then up here at the very top, we have the natural numbers and then other crazy things like the set containing all of the odd numbers, which perhaps isn't so crazy as far as infinite subsets of the naturals go. We have lots of other things up here where everything is infinite. Okay, so if we look at the collection of all natural numbers under the usual, or all subsets of the natural numbers under the usual ordering, then we have, as we already discussed, that this lattice is complete because arbitrary suprema and infima do exist. And they're actually given by just taking arbitrary unions and intersections. I guess I didn't really mention intersections before, but it's, uh, it's exactly the same sort of thing. So if we only look at those finite subsets of the natural numbers, so everything below the, the demarcation between the infinite and the finite, then we still have a lattice. It's still close to undertaking uh, meets and joins or intersections and unions in this case. Uh, however, as I already discussed, there are collections of elements in this lattice with no upper bound in this lattice, which only has the finite guys in it. Now, if I consider all of the finite subsets of the naturals, but also stick in one more element, which is the natural numbers itself, then I still have a lattice with respect to the usual ordering, but this new lattice is now complete because if I have some collection, like that collection of initial sections that I had looked at before, uh, that's the collection of all of these section guys for all natural numbers that I defined previously, which in other words is the set containing the set containing one and the set containing one and two and the set containing one and two and three and so on and so forth forever. Well, now this collection actually has an upper bound in my new lattice where I stuck on this new top element N and uh, so that upper bound is the set of all natural numbers. And as it happens, that's the least upper bound. And it turns out that sticking on uh, this, one, this one new element at the top here does actually resolve all of, my, <laughs> all of my obstructions to having a complete lattice. And so this new lattice is complete. So even though, well, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so that does actually give me a complete lattice. Um, and you can think if you'd like to a little more about why uh, no matter what collection of uh, subsets I take, if their union would be infinite, then their least upper bound in this new lattice is actually the natural numbers itself, even if that isn't the union of all of those subsets. But okay, so this is another example of a complete lattice where I kind of threw out all the infinite stuff except for the natural numbers. Now for a different example, still using the natural numbers, but no longer looking at all subsets, if I consider the natural numbers under their usual ordering, so I have a Hasse diagram that looks like this, one, two, three, four, and so on forever, then this lattice is actually not complete and the reason for that is that if I take any subset, then that subset, um, if it's if I take any infinite subset, then that infinite subset will have no upper bound in the natural numbers. And so, uh, so this is not a complete lattice. However, if I stick on, if I stick on one more element called infinity, which is defined to be above everything else in the natural numbers that I already had before, then this new lattice is actually complete. And
again, similar to our example over here where we stuck on the natural numbers as our new top element, uh, this element infinity will actually be the least upper bound of any, uh, any infinite collection of elements of our original lattice here. Okay, so those examples were somewhat similar to each other. Now for something a little more different, let's consider the real numbers under their usual ordering. So whose meet and join operations correspond to taking the minimum and maximum of pairs of numbers. Well, if I denote the real numbers by a sort of a Hasse diagram like this. So if this is my real line, then uh, the real numbers in our sense are not complete because if I take any subset, like say all of the natural numbers, so one, two, three, and so forth, so on forever, this has no upper bound in the real numbers because of course, if I take larger and larger natural numbers, uh, I'm not going to be able to find a real number that's bigger than every single natural number. And so, and so we see that the least upper bound of the naturals doesn't exist. So this doesn't exist because there's not even an upper bound for this set. So that's kind of the same problem that we've had before. Uh, and so the reals are not complete according to this language although this is contrary to what you may have seen in analysis or topology. And so the difference here is that we're not distinguishing between bounded and unbounded sets. So we don't care about the situation with the natural numbers in analysis because we only want to have a least upper bound for those sets which are bounded above. And so the important thing about the real numbers or one important thing is that they have this least upper bound property, but it only applies to subsets that have an upper bound. In lattice theory, we're often concerned with the much stronger condition that all subsets have a, a least upper bound. And so that's that explains the similarity in the language, but also an important difference. And so in lattice theory, if you want to turn the real numbers into a complete lattice in the lattice theoretic sense, then what you need to do is after all of these guys at the very bottom, you need to stick on one more element called negative infinity. And after all of these guys at the very top, you need to stick on an infinity to obtain the extended real numbers. So this, this collection of things is also known as the extended, extended reals. And so with these new bottom and top elements, we actually do obtain a complete lattice. And so uh, again, for reasons very similar to the ones we've described in other examples, uh, the, these uh, elements, negative infinity and infinity actually allow us to take arbitrary infinite meets and joins, if you will, or infima and suprema and, uh, and actually obtain an element in our lattice. Okay. So that's a whole host of examples and non-examples. Now let's take a look at subuniverse and congruence lattices. And so at long last, I kept saying that I was going to do it eventually. And now here it is, I'm doing it. Uh, we will make the, uh, we will make <laughs> lattices out of the subuniverses and congruences of algebras. In order to do this, we need to use the following result, which is that if P is a poset where arbitrary infima exists for any subset of our poset, then P is actually a complete lattice. So just having that P is a poset with this condition on infima is enough to have a complete lattice. And so we are, so if we want to actually prove this, then we already have that P has arbitrary infima. So it remains to show that P has arbitrary suprema. And so if we have some subset of our points in our post set P 
then we must produce the supremum of that collection within the post at P somehow. So one idea is that we could take this collection big Y, which consists of all the little y, which are upper bounds for x. So, and that means again, remember that y is greater than or equal to little x for all little x in x, in big x. And so then we have the ability to take arbitrary infima already. So let's define little a to be the infimum of this collection of upper bounds for the set x. It seems plausible that this little a would be the, the least upper bound of the set x because it is the infimum of the collection of all upper bounds of x. But we need to be careful. So first, notice that given any little x in x, we have that x is less than or equal to y for each y, little y in y because that's what it means to belong to this uh, to, for y to belong to this set big Y. And so that means though that X is actually a lower bound for the set big Y for any little X that we take. Okay, so since A is the greatest among those lower bounds uh, of Y, we definitely have that X is less than or equal to A because A is a lower bound for Y. And so it must be greater than or equal to any other lower bound, such as this little x. Okay, so that means that A is greater than or equal to any element of X. And so it is uh, certainly an upper bound for X, which means that it belongs to Y because A is actually greater than or equal to anything in X. So A is an upper bound for X, but it's actually the infimum of this collection Y. So it must be the smallest possible element of that set Y because it's actually in there. And so A is the least upper bound uh, for X. It's the smallest among all the upper bounds. So uh, our intuition <laughs> turns out to be correct and uh, taking the infimum of all of the upper bounds does actually give us the least upper bound for the set X, but that's exactly what we wanted to construct because now we know that A is actually uh, the supremum of X and the A actually belongs to P because P has arbitrary infima. Okay, great. So that gives us an easier condition to check when we want to see if a poset is actually a complete lattice. And we also have a corollary which applies to subuniverses and congruences. And so it turns out that the subuniverses and congruences of any algebra form complete lattices. So more explicitly, if we have an algebra A, then we actually have that, that the subuniverse lattice of A, whose elements are the subuniverses of A, ordered by containment, and also the congruence uh, lattice of A, whose elements are congruences of A, also ordered by containment. These guys are both complete sublattices, or complete, sorry, complete lattices. Okay, so. Given any algebra A, we have these two great examples of complete lattices. Of course, it's not really that crazy that these guys would be complete lattices if, uh, if everything's finite, but in the infinite case, we, we get some interesting examples. So how do we prove this? Well, we already know that uh, the collection of subuniverses of A and the collection of congruences of A are closed undertaking arbitrary intersections, which give our arbitrary infima. And so if you accept that they're, that they're posets, then we're done. There is one point which I have slept, which I have swept under the rug in a previous talk though. How do we compute the intersection of an empty collection of subsets? And 
if you think about this for a minute, you'll realize that uh, it seems like there's a problem if I try to write the intersection of the empty collection is the set of all x such that um, such that uh, say for all um, for all u, which are subsets of the empty set x is in u. This would agree with uh, sort of the conventional definition of taking an intersection of a collection of sets. However, I noticed that this condition is vacuously true because there are, um, oh, okay, well, no, 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 I'm sorry. So it's not that it's vacuously true, but, but that, um, Okay, so I notice I notice that uh, if I say okay for all for all um, oh no no I'm not not subsets for all you that are elements of the empty set okay see even I'm even I'm tripping over myself trying to trying to express this corner case all right so the point is this normally when you take the intersection of a collection of sets what you do is you say something like well it's the collection of all elements x so that if I look at any set u that is a member of my collection, which is the empty set in this case, then I know I want that little x to belong to uh, the set u. However, if I do this, and now I knew that I was, I had, I had swapped something before because I, I wasn't getting what I wanted. So now there is no set u, which is an element of the empty set. And so this condition is vacuously true this is always true because it's just a vacuous truth. There are no such U, which are elements of the empty set. And so this looks like it should be a, a set of all elements, which a set of all things, which, which does not exist. Uh, this classic naive set theory. Um, so this is a problem. And this is clearly not what we should mean by taking the intersection of an empty collection of sets. Okay, so it is actually still true if we use the right definition. That is, it's still true that that sub universes and congruences of A are both closed under arbitrary intersections. Even when we intersect zero of them, we just have to define what we actually mean. So I was kind of cheap and <laughs> skipped over this before, and now I'm going to discuss it. So if we're being really careful, then when we compute an intersection of a collection of sets, we should always actually specify the, that that collection is a subset of the collection of subsets of a given set A. So uh, in set theory language, I think that people would say that this is a, this is a universal set, um, or is our universe, uh, which is obviously very similar to the situation in universal algebra where for example, when we do this for the subuniverse lattice, the set A will actually be the universe of our algebra, although we might be looking at something like A squared if we're talking about the congruence lattice instead. Either way, the important thing is to define the intersection to actually be with reference to this universal set, say A or A squared, depending on the situation. So it should be all little a in A, so that for all x in our collection of subsets script x, A is in that set x. And so now, if it happens that this is actually the empty set, this condition does become vacuously true. But if I look at all of the little a in A that have satisfied some vacuously true condition, that just gives me the entire set A back, and that's okay, and actually what I want. And so, and so if you're careful with the definition, you will see that actually what I had said before is still true. I was just kind of uh, being a little sketchy about this corner case. And if you use the correct definition, uh, where you actually have more of a well-formed <laughs> construct here, then you can just take the intersection of an empty collection of sets and get something that makes sense. So that's really the only difficulty there. And then by our previous uh, statement, 
we know that that these guys will actually be complete lattices, that the subuniverses and the congruences will both each give us a complete lattice, no matter what algebra we start out with. So a uh, little more of a historical digression now. Recall that Orr had a program during the 1930s where lattices became the central objects of study in all of mathematics. He called them structures and they were, they were the main thing. So one of the shortcomings of this approach is that it was not clear how to extract all properties of an object from a corresponding lattice. So there are many ways, as we've already seen, and we'll see more, <laughs> to associate a lattice to um, a given mathematical object, like an algebra or a topology. Uh, however, it's not really clear exactly how to do this for a general sort of mathematical object. Um, in a way that captures all of the properties that you'd like to capture. So for example, let's consider the cyclic groups C2 and C3 of order two and three respectively. So the subuniverse lattice of uh, C2 actually has, actually has uh, two elements. We have the set containing just uh, say zero or the identity and then the set containing just uh, the set containing zero and one, say, if we write C2 as a, as a set, we're going to just have zero and one. And then if we write C3 as a set or its underlying universe, we're going to have zero, one, and two. Then, well, there are two subuniverses of the group of order two the trivial subgroup and the whole thing. Similarly, there are two subuniverses of the group of order three, the trivial subgroup, which just has zero or the identity, and the one that has all of the elements, zero, one, and two, say, because the other two non-identity elements generate the group. Okay, so now the congruence lattice of a group is actually isomorphic to the lattice of normal subgroups of that group. But since the uh, cyclic groups C2 and C3 are abelian, uh, this is actually nothing but the lattice of subgroups again, which the lattice of subuniverses is also that same lattice. And so this is also the two element lattice. And similarly for uh, the cyclic group of order three, we also obtain a two element lattice. And so this two is just used to denote the two element lattice, which has two elements and this Hasse diagram of a bottom element, say zero, and a top element, say one. And so as you may verify, all of these two element lattices are isomorphic to each other. They are the same lattice in that sense although there might be different labels for their elements. And so even if we have the sub, even if we have uh, two groups and we have the sub algebra or, su or sub universe lattice for those groups and the congruence lattice for those groups and we understand what those are, it's possible that those are all the same for two different groups and those two different groups are not the same mathematical object. Because for example, uh, C2 satisfies this identity, say X squared, if we're doing multiplicative notation is the identity, but that's not satisfied, uh, that's not satisfied by the cyclic group of order three, which has elements which do not square it to the identity. And so, uh, so clearly just knowing the sub, the sub universe lattice and the congruence lattice of uh, two algebras, like say two groups, uh, even if we know that those are all the same, that doesn't um, tell us that those objects are the same. Or in other words, uh, C2 and C3 have different algebraic properties. One satisfies an identity that the other one doesn't. They're different mathematical objects um, in, in any reasonable sense. However, if I look at these two standard lattices to associate to them, uh, they're all the same. And so I don't wanna discourage you 
I obviously, uh, since I'm giving this series of talks, think that universal algebra and lattice theory are really cool. And you can tell a lot about an algebra by its lattice of congruences. However, only that information cannot help you to distinguish between uh, between two different two different algebras. Um, you can't actually tell these math distinct mathematical objects apart by looking at only this information. And so it's a it's a great tool. It's very interesting, but it's certainly not the whole story. And this is one of the reasons that Orr's program kind of fell by the wayside. Okay. And so actually. Um, Okay, so actually back in the 1920s, which was even before Orr had started his program, as far as I know, uh, Ada Rotlander studied the problem of distinguishing groups by their subgroup lattices using only those isomorphisms which respect conjugation. So this is a stronger condition that's also incorporating uh, the action of a group on itself by conjugation. She found that even under the stricter condition, there were still non-isomorphic pairs of groups with isomorphic. I'm really liking the definite article right now with isomorphic subgroup lattices. So even if you impose the stricter condition, you can find two non you can find two non-isomorphic groups whose subgroup lattices are isomorphic, even if the if the isomorphism has to respect this additional structure. And so actually. Uh, this is further evidence, which already existed even when um, Orr was uh, doing his work, that says that although you can perhaps tell quite a bit about an algebra by its, uh, its subalgebra or congruence lattices, you certainly cannot tell everything. <laughs> okay. So we actually have uh, another corollary now. Um, for, to our earlier proposition, which will help us in the discussion of our next topic, which is complete sublattices. So if we take any set A, then we can form a lattice out of the equivalence relations on A by ordering them by containment. It turns out that this lattice is actually also a complete lattice. And the argument for that is basically the same as the argument that we uh, that we made before, because um, if we actually uh, think about it a little bit, um, we can form an algebra A with no basic operations. So it's basically the set A as an algebra, and then any equivalence relation will be a congruence. And so this is actually a corollary of what we had already stated before, because in this case, will actually have, so in this case that our algebra A has no basic operations, we'll actually have that uh, the congruence lattice of A is nothing but the lattice of equivalence relations on, on A because any equivalence relation will be a congruence uh, because the basic operations don't impose any additional constraints. Okay. So we actually have for any set A that the equivalence relations on A form a complete lattice. And so now we know that the equivalence relation lattice supports taking arbitrary joins, but how do we actually compute them? Arbitrary meets are easy because in this equivalence relation lattice, we have that the arbitrary intersection of a bunch of equivalence relations is again, uh, an equivalence relation, and it's actually it's actually the uh, infimum of that collection, and that's that's pretty straightforward. On the other hand, we don't really have a very explicit description of um, we don't really have a very explicit description of the join of some infinite collection of equivalence relations, because the way we had gotten this before was by taking. Uh, by taking the infimum of the uh, collection of all, uh, say, oh, say psi, I guess. So equivalence relation psi, so that uh, 
psi was an upper bound for this collection theta. So that was what we had done in the proof that having a post set with arbitrary uh, infima was enough to get um, a complete lattice. But um, this isn't a very explicit description because it requires us to actually form the collection of all upper bounds for this set of uh, equivalence relations, which is in general going to be a very large set of things to describe. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, it turns out that if we have a set A and some collection of equivalence relations on it, then uh, the this arbitrary join of these equivalence relations in this lattice is we take this relation zero, which just has all of the uh, of the, okay, so remember this, this guy has all of the pairs, little a, little a, so that a is an a, it's the diagonal or the, the trivial equivalence relation. And then we're going to union that with uh, this big union of this arbitrary, or this large union of uh, these relative products of of theta one, theta two, up through theta k, where we can take any number k of little thetas, which belong to our family big theta. So basically, we're going to form all of these different possible uh, relations by taking the relative product of any finite number of little thetas in our family of equivalence relations that we started with. And then we're going to union all of those together and also stick in this diagonal or zero uh, relation. And that is going to give us another equivalence relation, which is this arbitrary join in this lattice of equivalence relations. And so that's a much more explicit description of uh, the join than just saying it's the infimum of all the upper bounds of, uh, of the collection of equivalence relations big theta. So I'm just going to sketch this proof. Let's uh, denote the left and right hand sides by alpha and beta respectively. So alpha is this join and beta is this uh, union and we don't yet know that they're equal. So I'm going to show that they're each subsets of each other. Uh, so we can actually argue that beta is an equivalence relation similarly, similarly to how we gave an explicit construction of the congruence uh, generated by a collection of pairs before. This is a little different because we're starting off with a bunch of equivalence relations instead of just a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, pairs, but uh, it's a similar similar idea. Uh, and then it will it will follow from that that if this is an equivalence relation, well, it certainly contains all of the uh, individual little thetas because we can always take k to just be one, and then we'll just have a single theta one here that we're unioning in, and so this is going to be an equivalence relation. This beta is going to be an equivalence relation that contains all of the little thetas. And that means that it's, it's, um, it certainly must contain the smallest equivalence relation that contains all of the little thetas. And so that gives us, that gives us this, this direction that, that alpha is contained in beta. So to show the other containment, uh, note that if I have um, some collection of k many little thetas here, that's uh, oh, that's supposed to be theta k. That's uh, if I take the relative product, then actually uh, each of these little thetas must be in the smallest equivalence relation that contains all of them, and so each of these guys is contained in alpha. And so this relative product is a subset of the relative product of alpha with itself k many times, but that product is again just alpha. And so uh, we actually have that each of these rel finite relative products of theta one, theta two, up through theta k is actually a subset of alpha. And then the zero relation is also a subset of any equivalence relation. And so uh, unioning all of those together we're certainly going to get something which is contained in alpha still. Okay, so that's a sketch of the proof. And so we have this explicit way of actually computing 
joins in the lattice of equivalence relations. All right, now uh, let's actually discuss complete sublattices and we'll see why we were so concerned with an explicit description of those joins in a little bit. So if we have a complete lattice L and a sublattice M of L, we say that M is a complete sublattice when given any subset of M, we have that the join the, or the supremum and the infimum of X as computed in the lattice L are elements of M. So the, the, these uh, least upper bound and greatest lower bounds must actually be computed in the original big lattice L. And if it happens that they are still elements of M, then uh, that's what that's the situation where we say that M is a complete sublattice of L. So all sorts of different things are possible. It's possible for complete lattices to have sublattices which are incomplete and vice versa. Uh, so we already saw some examples. And if you go back and look at uh, our examples, you'll start to see those different possibilities have already arisen. Um, so now I would like you to consider that uh, there's another uh, perhaps at first surprising situation that can arise. So if we take the lattice of finite subsets of the naturals, which I'm just going to denote by this blob that are the finite subsets of the natural numbers. And then we stick on above all of that, we stick on the natural numbers like we had before. This is a complete lattice, as we discussed previously, which is a sublattice of the lattice, which I might denote like this consisting of all of all uh, subsets of the natural numbers. And this, this sub, all of the subsets of the natural numbers also form a complete lattice with the usual ordering. However, this thing is not a complete sublattice of this thing. And so the reason is what we already discussed. If I'm looking, if I'm looking in this lattice and I compute the join, uh, over all natural numbers of all of these initial sections. Oh no, that's actually still giving me the same answer. Uh, okay, if I compute, for instance, um, okay, so if I compute, for instance, the join um, over all uh, natural numbers of all of the singleton sets um, to n, then in the first lattice, I'm going to get, I'm going to get just n because, okay, yeah, in this first lattice, I'm going to get just n because this collection is, is, is infinite. And so I'm going to, I would get an infinite subset, except there are none. And so the only upper bound and the least upper bound is the natural numbers. However, in the second lattice, if I compute the same join, of all of these singleton sets, I'm actually just going to get their union, which is the set consisting of all of the all of the even numbers, two, four, six, and so forth. And so these two elements are not the same. And so this is actually not a complete sublattice of this one, even though they are both complete lattices. So it's important to remember that a complete sublattice is more special than just a sublattice, which is also complete. It actually has to agree in the sense that its arbitrary joins have to match up with arbitrary joins in the big lattice. Okay, so that's what a complete sublattice is. Now, why are we introducing this? Besides that it's a uh, somewhat logical thing to do with complete lattices. Well, uh, we have some standard examples of complete sublattices. If we have any algebra A, then the congruence lattice of A is a complete sublattice of the lattice of all equivalence relations on A. And so having an explicit description of how to take joins in this lattice of all equivalence relations actually tells us how to take explicit joins in the congruence lattice for any algebra A 
whose universe is this set A. Moreover, if B is a reduct of A, and so what this means, since I think I may have not addressed this yet, is if we have A as some algebra with some collection F of basic operations, we say that B is a reduct of A when B is going to be an algebra with the same universe, but a di different collection of basic operations so that G is actually a subset of F. So for example, if my algebra A has a single set and then some basic operations F1, F2, then a reduct of A could be, for example, um, A and then just the operation F1. Another possible reduct that would be a different algebra but would also be a reduct as AF2. And I actually can take just the set A viewed as an algebra, as I mentioned earlier, with no basic operations at all. And that would also be a reduct. Okay, so that's what it means for B to be a reduct of A. You just throw out some of the basic operations. Well, in that case, the congruence lattice of A is a complete sublattice of the congruence lattice of B. And so, it makes sense that at least the congruence lattice of A should be somehow contained in the congruence lattice of B because a congruence is an equivalence relation which has to satisfy that substitution property. Well, if I throw away some of my basic operations, it gets easier to satisfy that substitution property. And so I should get more stuff. And if you think of the extreme example where I throw out all of the basic operations, well, the congruence lattice there is just going to be the equivalence relation lattice. And so that's all possible equivalence relations and it's very big. So throwing out operations gives you a bigger congruence lattice. And it turns out that actually, whenever you do that, you'll have the your original congruence lattice is a complete sublattice of the new one. So that's pretty helpful too. Now I want to finish today by giving two classic results on the congruence lattices of groups and lattices. So first, uh, Dedekind, who did, as I mentioned before, some of the initial work in lattice theory around the year 1900, uh, Dedekind proved that the congruence lattice of a group is modular. So any, any group if you look at its congruence lattice, that lattice will satisfy the modular law that we discussed previously. And so, uh, and so we're going to give this proof in a way that's um, a little more abstract and uses our nice unified language from universal algebra in order to argue this. However, uh, you may also be interested after seeing this proof to go back and try to actually write it out in terms of normal subgroups the way that Dedekind would have uh, 120 years ago, the time of this recording. So first, note that if alpha and beta are group congruences, then if I have a pair x, y in the relative product of alpha and beta, by definition, there's some z in my collection of group elements, so that x is related to z by alpha, and z is related to y by beta. That's just the definition. But then it follows that, well, if I have, if I have X, uh, okay, so if I have X alpha Z, then, oh no, I wanted to start the other way first. So first, if I have, I have Z beta Y, the substitution property says that, that if I multiply on the left by X Z inverse, then I'll still have two things which are related. And so if you want to write it out this way, we know that we know that z beta y, and we know that we know that uh, xz inverse beta xz inverse. And that's just because uh, beta is a congruence and so is an equivalence relation and hence reflexive. And so then the substitution property, since beta is a congruence and satisfies that property, says that, um, okay, I guess I wanted to multiply on the other side either way, uh, says that um, 
Okay, I won't be lazy. I'll rewrite it. All right. So we like to think of the top as being the left-hand side, I suppose. So xc inverse, beta xc inverse, because beta is reflexive. And then because beta has the substitution property, I can multiply down the columns and get xc inverse times z must be related under beta to xz inverse y. OK, but then xz inverse z is just x, according to the group laws. And so I get that uh, x is related by beta to xz inverse y. OK, well, why am I doing that? Because now, if I look on the other side and note that x is related to z by alpha, then using a similar argument, I have that x alpha z and then z inverse y is related to z inverse y by alpha because alpha is reflexive. And then by substitution, I have that x z inverse y is related by alpha to z, z inverse y, but that is just y. And so in the end, I see that x is related by beta uh, to something which is related by alpha to y, but that's precisely what it means for xy to be in beta relative product of beta with alpha, because I have x beta something, which is this, uh, alpha y. I don't really care what this is as long as it gets me to the other side. OK, but that argument is symmetric. And so I actually find that alpha composed with beta or alpha relative product of beta is the same as beta composed with alpha. And so in this situation, we say that alpha and beta permute. And it'll also follow if you analyze our previous description of the join of uh, congruences that uh, actually in this case, alpha join beta is going to be the relative product of alpha and beta in either order because they're equal. So what we've just argued here is that the congruences of a group permute according to this new language that we just introduced. So all of these things are the same. Alpha composed with beta, beta composed with alpha, and alpha join beta is congruences in the congruence lattice. OK, so that was the first observation. And now we can use that in order to prove that the congruence lattice of a group is modular. So we're, we're not actually done yet. <laughs> OK, so now that we know how to compute joins very easily in the case of group congruences, we can make the following argument if this would step forward. There we go. OK, so now suppose that alpha, beta, and gamma are congruences with gamma less than or equal to or a subset of alpha. We must show the non-trivial containment, because remember there were two directions for the, for the modular law, and we must show the non-trivial containment, which is the alpha meet beta join gamma is contained in alpha meet beta join gamma. So if I take x, y, a pair in this congruence, whatever it is, then there must be some z so that x beta z gamma y because that's what it means for x, y to be in uh, to be in beta join gamma, which is actually, as we now know, beta relative product with gamma, because of the fact that congruence is uh, permute. And so, so we have this, and since gamma is a subset of alpha, we actually have. Uh, that z alpha y alpha x. And so the reason for this is that uh, we have, um, OK, so then we have, we have z. OK, so we have x beta z gamma y from this part. But x y is also in alpha. There we go. Now I'm not losing my mind so much anymore. X is, XY is also in alpha because it's in the, the meat of these two congruences. And so, and so, um, okay, I think I just totally lost it again. All right.
All right, thanks, thanks for bearing with me. I just paused for a second so I could collect myself. Okay, this is actually oops, not what I wanted to do there. So this is actually not that, not that bad. I was just having uh, one of my, one of my little aneurysms. And so, okay, as I said before, the fact that uh, beta join gamma is uh, beta composed with gamma comes from that uh, the congruences of a group permute. And so from that, we get that there's some Z, so that X beta Z gamma Y, because that's what it means for X Y to be in the relative product of these two guys. Okay, great. So now I need to drag this back over. Okay, so since gamma is a subset of alpha, that means that if Z gamma Y, then Z alpha Y, because if ZY is in gamma and gamma is a subset of alpha, sure, surely ZY is in alpha. Great, so that's where that comes from. And now Y is Y alpha X, that's because XY is in alpha, but alpha is an equivalence relation, so that means that YX is in alpha as well, and that means that Y alpha X, okay? so. A little embarrassing, but I'm very lazy and I don't really care to edit this to make myself look better. It's been a long day. So Z alpha Y alpha X, but that means that Z, uh, that means, uh, okay, so then that means that X, uh, so X beta Z and also um, X alpha Z, right? So X Z is in beta and X Z is in alpha because Z alpha X by transitivity. And so if X Z is in both of these guys, then surely X Z is in the meat of them. X Z is in alpha meat beta. Okay, so that means X alpha meet beta Z, but then Z is related to Y by gamma, but then this is what it means for X to be related to Y by alpha, oops, alpha, alpha meet beta relative product with gamma but because the congruences of a group permute, this is the same thing as having alpha meet beta join gamma. And so XY is in alpha meet beta join gamma, which is what I was trying to show. So I do have containment in the non-trivial direction and thus the modular law is satisfied. And again, I thank you for bearing with me. Uh, and I hope that that didn't interrupt your understanding as I sort of had a little moment where I checked out. <laughs> okay. So uh, Dedekind did not make this argument precisely, oops, precisely this way. Um, oh, I keep trying to click on my pen and I keep clicking on the other thing. That's horrifying. All right. Okay, here we go. So yeah, Dedekind did not argue this this way. So instead of congruences, he looked at normal subgroups and as we discussed previously, there is actually a precise correspondence between the normal subgroups of a group and the congruences of that group viewed as an algebra in the appropriate way. And so uh, you can make the same arguments here, except instead of meets and joins, you'll have uh, analogous operations. And I encourage you to go through that on your own if you have not already, uh, because that is um, also entertaining to see it the way that he saw it. Okay, so now uh, finally, we will talk about the congruence lattice of lattices. Um, so in 1942, so almost half a century later, uh, Funayama and Nakayama showed that the congruence lattice of any lattice is distributive. And so this is a difference between groups 
in lattices, in lattices actually, their congruence lattices um, satisfy different, different laws. Uh, so the congruence lattice of any lattice actually has to be distributive, but uh, there are groups whose, whose congruence uh, lattices are, are, yeah, so it's any, any lattice has to have its congruence lattices is, is, is distributive. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that is, uh, yeah, but that is not, that is not the, that is not as strong as, as having, uh, as having that it's modular. So, okay. So the congruences of a lattice don't generally commute. So this argument takes a little more work. We actually have to use the majority terms that we discussed previously when looking at uh, different characterization of distributivity, and those will be very helpful. Um, but I'm actually not going to do that today uh, because I've already <laughs> tripped over myself enough for one afternoon. And so I'm going to thank you again for bearing with me. And I hope that you have a fantastic rest of your day or night or whatever it is, wherever you are. Thank you.